Hello and welcome on this Tuesday afternoon. It is a rather rainy day here in Amsterdam where I'm currently on Heerengracht, completely alone, physically alone that is, in a very empty institute. My name is Sophia and I work as a program curator here at the Goethe Institute Amsterdam. And this program is a collaboration between us and Frame of Frit. Frame of Framed is a very inspiring platform for contemporary art, visual culture, and critical theory and practice in the east of Amsterdam. And if you happen to be in Amsterdam, I really recommend visiting them. They present a variety of exhibitions in collaboration with curators and artists, as well as an extensive public program. And I think their next exhibition will start in September, just after the summer break. And the Goethe Institute is the cultural institute of Germany with a global reach and our cultural and educational programs encourage intercultural dialogue and, en and enable cultural involvement. Thank you, Framer Frame, for this collaboration. This is truly great. So just a few words to start about the series Crisis Imaginaries. The idea of having a program that takes its starting point from the current COVID-19 crisis and draws attention to the other crisis and as the climate catastrophe I'm talking about, was born out of a sense of urgency. All of a sudden, we're able to experience what is actually possible when a crisis is happening in front of our eyes, threatening our lives and communities and obviously our economy. And so we watched the two crises entwine on many levels. And then the brutal murder of George Floyd brought forward the ongoing crisis of institutional racism and violence. Black Lives Matter became much more visible on a worldwide scale, and it was then clear for us that the second chapter taking place today, visibility, politics, and climate justice, should focus on intersectional crisis talks, another sense of urgency thus. In this panel, we want to address in which way social inequality and institutional racism trace for our environmental politics. What is climate racism? How do we distribute planetary wealth? What practices of listening do we need? What sort of climate activism considers actually colonial and racist violence and their entanglement with the current climate crisis? How can we engage politics of visibility within climate movements to shatter systemic exclusion, exclusions? Whose stories do we hear and whose stories did we not hear yet? Those are the questions of today and I think we have wonderful people here with us to discuss and listen to. Thank you, Freddy, for joining us as Kachi Hero Raki. Uh, and our moderator, Amanda, will introduce them in a minute. So let me introduce her first. Amanda Butskis is a professor of contemporary art history and theory at the University of Guelph. She's the author of Plastic Capitalism, Contemporary Art and the Drive to Waste, and The Ethics of Earth Art, and co editor of Heidegger and the Work of Art History. Her current project, Ecologicity, Visions and Art for a World to Come, considers modes of visualizing environments with a special focus on the circumpolar north. Uh, thank you for being with us today, for actually all the way from Canada. <laughs> and uh, before I give the word to Amanda, I would already like to invite everyone who is currently watching to join also for the third chapter chapter of the series, which will take place on the 25th of August, and it will be about climate feelings. We will talk about climate anxiety, mental health, beliefs and fears, and why it is necessary and what it means to engage on an emotional and effectual scale with climate crisis. Stay tuned on our website and social media for the upcoming um, events. But now, we want to talk about intersectional climate justice and please Amanda take over. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia and uh, the Goethe Institute and Framer Framed for convening such a uh, formidable panel of climate activists. Um, I just want to briefly uh, point to the fact that we are um, uh, quite an international panel today because I'm speaking to you from uh, Toronto, which is the traditional ter territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, uh, and which is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. 
Uh, Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. It's in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And so now I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists. We have um, Rocky App, uh, who works as a civil servant at the Ministry of the Interior. Rocky App is originally from West Papua. Uh, but he fled to the Netherlands with his mother and three brothers after the murder of his father, Arnold Aap. Uh, Rocky Aap later entered the Dutch army out of a desire to contribute to international peace uh, and security. So his military experience structured his youth and provided him with the discipline, knowledge and experience that he has used for his role uh, as a storyteller in the last 10 years. Op is uh, an activist who is committed to uh, the intersection of politics, human rights, and climate activism. Uh, because in West Papua, all these three elements have a common ground. Uh, in the Netherlands, he works to give the climate debate uh, a more indigenous perspective. So he tells the story of West Papua uh, with passion uh, as one that includes these three elements, politics, human rights, and environmentalism in an effort to inspire uh, all of us to act upon climate change with respect to this intersection. I'm pleased to introduce Asuka Kehler, who lives uh, in Frankfurt on Main. He's going to school uh, and is set to complete his exams next year. Keller has been uh, politically active for over a year now, mainly in the Fridays for Future movement, uh, both locally and nationwide. Um, if you don't know, Fridays for Future is a global movement that began in August 2018 when uh, the 15 year old Greta Thunberg and other youth activists began a school strike for climate. Um, so every school day for three weeks, they sat outside the Swedish parliament demanding urgent action. By September, uh, Greta Thunberg decided to continue striking every Friday until the Swedish policies changed their goal to align with the Paris Agreement to prevent the rise of global temperature by two degrees. So Asuka Kehler is one of the very few BIPOC members of the Fridays for Future movement. So his activism focuses on climate justice and equity for everyone while critically reflecting on that movement. He does this by bringing forward his perspective and expertise, talking about his experience and also works on the different aspects of climate justice from this intersectional viewpoint. And I'm uh, delighted to introduce Ch uh, Chihiro Guzabruk. Uh, I spent uh, about three hours uh, over the past few days watching uh, videos of hers um, from her very um, uh, comprehensive and information rich website. Um, Chihiro Guzabruk, I can say, um, has this quality of absolute courage. We will not die quietly. This is what she said uh, in a microphone at the Shell Board Annual General Meeting last year. She was one of four speakers from the Shell Must Fall Coalition. And I have to say this moment um, and this act of speaking to Shell um, was uh, thrilling to watch, but it is a formidable uh, gesture. They are um, a terrifying organization of power. As a filmmaker, poet, activist, trainer, and singer songwriter, Chihiro has been active in the climate movement for over a decade. Um, she's a participant in the Code Rude and Fossil Free Culture Movement, I guess a filming coordinator, for Greenpeace, campaign manager for uh, the municipality elections for Amsterdam, B1J1, the co-founder of Climate Liberation Block, 
and the decolonial foundation Arales. Uh, Chihiro is dedicated to restore and restory our relationship with Earth and each other. She recently contributed to the climate activism book, Nuhetno Khan, with an article, Climate Crisis is a Colonial Crisis. She wrote for the NY publication, Rent and, uh, Rape Enters the Scene, an article on ecocide and sexual abuse. Her climate justice feature filmed uh, in Bolivia called Radical Friends, played festivals in the Americas and Europe and won two jury awards. Chihiro is happiest when making music with others, for example, recording the Shell Must Fall song and retrieving erased history, relearning other ways of being that are threatened by colonial political economies. She has been, uh, she has given talks concerning climate racism the past, uh, over the past few years and is currently writing an indigenous futurist screenplay in which she gets to develop a radical alternative vision for society. Welcome. Um, I am, again, absolutely delighted to meet all of you. So I thought we would begin um, just, uh, I would like to give you each some time uh, to speak about your climate justice activism, uh, your approach, your ways of engaging people, um, your successes, uh, what kinds of thoughts and imperatives drive this, um, and essentially to, uh, to speak in whatever modality um, befits your activism. So let's begin with Rocky App. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Amanda, for the kind introductions and the good Institute and Frame of Frame for this um, uh, organizing this beautiful and important event where I'm honored to be uh, one of these uh, fantastic panel, panel members. So my name is Rocky Up, and I'm the spokesperson for Free West Papua Campaign, uh, who exists to highlight the injustice which are going on for the last six decades in West Papua. And for those who do not know where it is, it's the island of New Guinea right above the Australian continent. And it's the Western half of the island, which was a former Dutch colony, part of the Dutch East Indies. And after the independence of Indonesia, where West Papua wasn't in the first place, um, uh, part of, of, of the ne negotiation, it was forced under hu a huge international pressure to become part of the Indonesia we know today without the consultation of the indigenous peoples of West Papua. Uh, so since that moment, we feel we are colonized, marginalized, and oppressed and killed in our own country. And that transformed me to the all activist I became today. Um, uh, because after the murder, assassination of my father, Arnold Abu, who was an anthropologist and a famous musician, because he, he made songs about the injustice which are happening there, about the identity of the indigenous West Papua's, he formed a threat under the new colonizers, Indonesia, and therefore they put him in prison. And four months after, before I was born, he was he was assassinated. And that was the starting point for me and my brothers and my mom to, to um, uh, go to the Netherlands as former colonizers, because there are a lot of West Papuans here, uh, to start a new life. And uh, a new country I, I, where I grew up without a father. Um, we didn't have, my mom didn't have a lot of money, so to have some foundation, I joined the military because I thought this is the right choice to contribute to peace and justice. And some, somehow I could create change for the people of Papua. Uh, but I find out that it was not the idea of peace and justice I expected because behind this institution of, of military, there is a political game uh, which had you know, other um, thoughts about how they should create peace and justice. And I find out that this, this, this political game actually was at the root causes of what, uh, where West Papua ended in a new colonization of Indonesia, where uh, Dutch co companies um, um, make sure that their profit was about, above human lives. So realizing that I still work as civil servant in the Netherlands, but I was I started to educate it myself about why I fled my home country and what is actually happening there. And for those who doesn't know it, West Papua houses the third largest rainforest after the Amazon and the Congo back. And so it is a frontline area for those who wanted to fight climate change to understand what is happening there. And that has transformed me from a freedom fighter, which I'm actually, uh, uh, which I'm, which I am, to a climate activist as well. 
where I'm highlighting and focusing on the indigenous perspective in the broad climate change discussion in the first place in the Netherlands. But soon I started to join uh, Extinction Rebellion in the UK because I find out that they are highlighting the root causes of climate change, which is colonialism, capitalism, and racism. And all of these three elements are visible in West Papua and are the root causes of why I fled my home country in the first place. Because once the house of the indigenous West Papuans today become home of the world's biggest gold and copper mine owned by US and Australian uh, copper mine corporation, Freeport McMoran, uh, it becomes the home of B British Petroleum and the res uh, recent decade it become home of palm oil companies destroying millions of hectares of indigenous uh, rainforest. So knowing that that is happening, they are polluting uh, our lands, uh, poisoning our rivers and destroying our livelihoods and, and environment. And this is the perspective from indigenous peoples in West Papua, but also from a lot of indigenous communities in the Amazon in Africa and the people, you know, in the global south, which I miss in the discussion about climate change, for example, in the Netherlands. And this is what, what, what triggered me. How is this possible? And if you look at, I feel supported by the outcome of the U United Nations um, uh, Intergovernment Bill on Climate Change, which state that 5% of the global, global population exists of indigenous communities and their way of lives um, um, make sure that 80% of the world's biodiversity could be preserved. This is, I think, the most relevant outcome. If you, at the same time, we see that the destruction of rainforest for 97% happens on indigenous lands at the same time. So I think this, these numbers make it absolutely crucial if we wanted to stop climate change, we must respect indigenous peoples and protect their rights and their lands. And that's what makes me optimistic about educating people on universities, academics, politicians about this most crucial, um, obvious solution to stop climate change, which is, which is protecting indigenous peoples. Um, and that is what I'm educating uh, people here from, in the first place, as freedom fighter, because from my point of view, for the people of West Papua, it's about unfinished decolonization of former Dutch New Guinea, as which we know today is West Papua. It's about corporate greed by these gold mines, uh, extracting our resources, killing my people. Um, and the last 60 years, the last 60 years, my father's storage is one of them. More than 500,000 indigenous West Papua have been estimated by NGOs, have been killed under brutal Indonesian military occupation. That's one third of my population. How is it possible that I have to educate Dutch students about our shared history? And I think this is exactly the problem which we are facing, climate change could happen because these kinds of stories don't end at schools, don't end in the media, don't end at, at polit political decision-making, but also at environmental organizations. For example, when I look at the campaign of Greenpeace or Milieu Defense in the Netherlands or other environmental organizations, and they're using, um, uh, for example, the extinction of orang-utans in Indonesia which I, you know, this, um, which I'm sorry uh, about, but what about the 500,000 indigenous Papuans who have been killed in Indonesia? Are our lives less worth than animals? And this is something I want them to think about because what are we mentioning? Uh, what do we mean with climate justice when we care more than about animals and biodiversity than about human lives uh, who are at stake at the front lines? Uh, and that is something, a perspective I want young you know, climate activists, academics, and decision makers to explain. They should explain it. Why is it that Dutch environmental organizations doesn't know what is happening in a former colony which houses the third largest rainforest? It doesn't make sense. And this is the perspective I want them to think about because we can't afford us as climate change activists, those who want to stop climate change, to look away from the root causes of climate change. And all those elements are visible in West Papua. And that is why I'm very eager to explain them the importance of these stories. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda. Yes, thank you so much. I think um, you raised some some 
really crucial points that I want to return to in our discussion, namely um, the emerging alliances between Indigenous peoples across the world, so the globalization of Indigenous activism precisely because of the condition of, um, I mean, not just climate change, but environmental disaster, ecocide, um, and yeah. and on indigenous lands, and so these that is exactly the intersection that is the condition for these uh, alliances across the world. Super important, and then uh, and then uh, the uh, the recoil of that, which is a critique of the existing organizations. And I think you you pose this yeah. question well: Why are indigenous lives worth less than animals, or less than yeah. some kind of abstraction of environment? Mm -hmm. And so there are legal yeah. issues, but there are also fundamental issues um, and, and so I would yes yeah, so I would like to return uh, to those questions as well and I, I can I can feel our other two panelists um, <laughs> engage with this as well so now I'd like to turn to Asuka Kehler so please yes. uh, tell us about your work yeah uh, thank you very much for having me on this discussion it was a very unexpected pleasure to me to get this invitation um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, as you said, um, I just started with activism like one year ago, so I'm definitely the most unexperienced person here on this panel. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm very much at the beginning of, I would say, like an evolution an activist goes through in the way of how someone thinks about how uh, we look at problems. Um, the things Raki just said are like, things I just realized a few weeks ago. I've been active for over a year in a movement which claims to be a climate justice movement and I have never heard of these things till, yeah, till I discovered some videos online and just started to educate myself about it. And I think that is also a thing um, which happens to be very, very common uh, for especially young activists and especially for activists in Germany or like in other Northern or Western European countries where we're not confronted with, this, the, with these topics in school. And um, yeah, we don't get this kind of view uh, on topics usually. Um, so I think something I try to do right now is to bring these perspectives more into the Fridays for Future movement in Germany because they're completely missing. Like, I'm one of the very, very few POC or BPOC in, in the whole movement. We, we are like 50 persons nationwide. And we have roughly a couple of thousand uh, activists um, in all of the cities combined, uh, probably a lot of more. Um, and yeah, we are trying to raise our voice inside the movement to get more recognition, um, to bring a more, yeah, to bring another other perspectives to the struggle, to the fights that there has to be done more than just reduce the emissions, um, that, that this is not everything that is framed under this like climate justice um, term, under the term of climate justice. Um, because in our movement and Fridays for Future, a lot of people think of climate justice as just the uh, reducing of carbon emissions. But um, yeah, like the Western European countries, uh, who have a lot of high emissions have to pay more for it, but that's all. It's like just the consequences have to be, um, yeah, divided um, equally to the emissions they made. But the perspective of like the historical perspective, the perspective of the persons who have been killed, uh, who have been like, yeah, who have been gone through horrible things because of countries like Germany, because of countries like France, these perspectives are being ignored, widely ignored and, and neglected by a lot of people. And this is the thing I'm mainly focusing on right now to change this perspective in our movement. Because if you go on like this, it's like we're just another white uh, by, yeah, dominate a movement which is dominated by white people, um, by young white people, which is the difference. We have to be like the next generation. We have to do it better than the ones that came before us. And if we don't see those problems and what, if we don't address them, then our generation will continue to do the same things as the generations before us did. And that is something which we can't allow to happen. Because if we go on like this, 
we won't get to the point where we can say, yes, this is climate justice because we're missing essential parts of it. Thank you, Asuka. I think you're right. I think um, how can, I mean, there's the generational issue with Fridays for Future movement um, and, and especially the issue of um, the negligence um, and the negligence to educate. So in so many ways, what you're describing is the um, uh, sort of coming into a knowledge. It's not taught at school. <laughs> it's taught through your movement um, and the um, and and being uh, disoriented by it, but also feeling like the responsibility comes on your shoulders and then having to call uh, to call corporations uh, and whole generations to account for it. Um, and I think that that is important, but it's also this, the importance of education, uh, which you're speaking about, which Rocky has also been speaking about, um, you know, that, that kind of education, um, it, it, unless you choose to do it, unless you choose to find out, um, it's not going to sort of come to you naturally. And this is, you know, I'm, I'm a professor. I learned a lot from watching Chihiro's videos. <laughs> She's a wonderful historian. And that's the, you know, that's, uh, that's a pursuit in its own right. And that is, um, and that has to be uh, organized. And you're right. I mean, there's a way that what you're doing in your movement is modeling the kinds of social relationships that need to carry us forward into learning, but also, um, it, it, especially as, it, as you're saying, you're one of uh, only 50 uh, BIPOC members of this group, um, but, but like playing a crucial role in being there in order to model these, uh, these relationships and how things should be. And people are watching and this is, uh, you know, this is super important. Um, so Chihiro, I will turn, uh, turn over to you and you have a presentation. So I think uh, you can share your screen and, uh, and jump in. Sure, yes. So first also, thank you for inviting me. And also thank you for the people who are tuning in uh, with their curiosity to learn. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, so I can share a little bit more about what I do. So if it's uh, right, you'll be seeing my screen now. We uh, have a presentation. There we go. Um, so there are just uh, seven slides I'd like to share with you um, about how I position myself as an activist and also um, an activist with a background in media studies and film. Um, so first off, uh, my journey as an activist really uh, I put myself on the path when I made my feature film in Bolivia and the starting point was really challenging uh, colonialism in all the ways that it shows up in our culture and in all the ways that it kind of um, masks um, the systemic violence that drives um, expropriation from land, uh, dispossession of people and um, yeah, the, the, the marriage of, of the harm of uh, uh, to people and places. So um, the first scene starts at a playing a risk game and how we're enticed to, you know, have a conquering world mindset even in our gameplay and see this as somehow entertaining. Um, the rest of the movie takes place in Bolivia and what I really tried to shift away from was the type of storytelling in which climate is a story of pollution in the sky. You know, the 350 story of uh, this fight is about three, uh, 350 parts per million, uh, the, 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 this carbon dioxide that is kind of divorced from what happens on the ground and what has been happening on the ground for centuries. This grounded normativity that already sees like uh, climate disasters happening every week right now and has already had a long history of uh, oil companies, uh, coal mining, uh, displacing people for already more than a century. And so in the bottom of the screen, uh, you see uh, a picture of a war in the 30s in Bolivia. 
uh, is actually not part of the movie, but uh, I recently just found out also sharing that this learning is lifelong learning, that this war, the Chaco War, which it's known that a lot of indigenous people died on the Bolivian side and the Paraguayan side, and you know, like a lot of wars, you know, there's rich men talking for people dying. Um, this was actually funded by Shell on the Paraguay side and Standard Oil on the Bolivian side because they thought there was, you know, oil territory somewhere there. And so we see the weaponization of, um, yeah, poor people uh, and indigenous people in both territories to kill each other uh, for the profit of uh, oil. And so this is the kind of understanding that when we enter as an activist in our entry point, um, the fight isn't new, the fight isn't the beginning, and this is, we are in a midpoint and we are fighting with ancestors and intergenerational struggle. So how that shows up in, um, for example, social media channels, how I see that certain narratives get reproduced. Uh, Raki Ab was talking about this earlier about uh, showing orang utangs on, um, you know, bright green uh, NGO channels, um, that it's clickable, it's uh, uh, less political, it's easier for first engagement with big audiences. And so last year when you saw uh, in Australia like mass fires, uh, this photo of a baby kangaroo that died, which is absolutely heartbreaking, um, uh, went viral. Um, what you didn't see unless you were following like certain indigenous Instagram channels uh, was this other meme of so there is this fire which is destroying you know so many hectares millions of hectares and according to the media it's only animals and white people suffering they don't mention me and my people so this is uh, coming uh, from you know the perspective of the aboriginal indigenous people of Australia um, and this also relates to activists, uh, like just uh, last week, this was um, an article that uh, a friend from Germany uh, shared. Uh, she's part of the amazing uh, um, grassroots group of uh, Black Earth. Shout out, uh, they do um, by POC um, uh, organizing in Germany of we need to talk about racism, like doing a, a an, a direct action with an NGO and then not showing up anywhere in the pictures that are shared because the pictures of white people are more shareable. Uh, like this also gets translated to people that I know that have worked as journalists for newspapers uh, where it was even a rule that there was like no black or brown people on the front page because it would sell less papers and somehow this gets internalize like oh yeah you know certain things sell better so we adapt instead of challenge that this is a a, a very racist uh, premise to work under and um there's so many other memes in in bright green environmentalism or environmentalism of the rich that um with my work as an activist i try to uh push back on and make people see how it is erasing uh, the stories of the people who have been fighting to defend Earth the longest. So the idea of um, white female hands holding a little mm. plant and caring for the Earth, where care for Earth is usually both gendered and um, and uh, racialized, whereas. Uh, as Raki was also saying, 80% uh, of the remaining biodiversity is on the land of indigenous people. And so, and they're still fighting against like uh, UN uh, conservation policy that actually pushes them off the land to do conservation without people. Um, another frame that we often hear is, you know, do something good today for tomorrow, this whole future uh, frame. Um, well, you know, who's tomorrow? Many people have already uh, died or lost their home or lost so many, lost their livelihood in the past century. Um, this idea of green growth, that we can still have it all if only we just add a little bit of green dust uh, is one that you see more in the corporate sector. Um, instead of 
really recognizing that we need to uh, have a, a totally uh, system change towards circular uh, systems of reciprocity and really giving back to the land and that we don't only have rights, we have duties of care. And this idea of only putting in a different plug of energy, that it's an energy crisis. And if we only change to another energy, um, you know, uh, human supremacy, we are so smart, we can outsmart nature. And in that way, still perpetuate uh, an, an extractivist uh, uh, energy system where nature just works for us. So how does that fit in to today? Right, because like today, so many people are overwhelmed with the many uh, challenges and uh, changes and injustices that just seems to be stacking up forever on top of each other. And I think here again, history really helps to see the patterns. Um, it can seem like a lot of work to do all the historical research. But for me, it really helps me to not be overwhelmed by these injustices and to kind of see how the dots are connected. Um, so for instance, when people are fighting to make the statue of Leopold II a fall or write a, a, a graffiti on it as for, for being a racist colonial um, asshole um, in Belgium, um, I see that also as an environmental uh, act, even though um, that might not be front and center for everyone. Like what Leopold did in DCR in the Congo was uh, not only um, normalize the violence against the people there, like there was a genocide of, of, of half of the people that lived there. That's over 10 million people that died or were murdered, I should say. Um, and that went hand in hand with ecocide, the systemic destruction of the forest for palm oil, for rubber. And on that grew a company that we know today as Unilever. So to see that racism and colonialism and environmental destruction has gone hand in hand all along can also really help lay the foundation for working together in movements. You know, we may not be able to do everything in every action all the time. But if we know how we are connected in anti-oppression, then we can work together better in tandem. And the same goes for defund the police. You know, like defund the police, earth defenders around the world keep having to face militarized police because uh, all oppression is backed up by violence. And in, in, in the time that we live in is usually nation state violence, both military and police. And so this is a picture from Standing Rock. Um, but there are many other pictures that I could be showing that are not US centric, um, but this lives in the collective um, knowledge best. And also if we see the, 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 the build a storm, the, the, the statue storm for really um, intervening in this racist normalization of everyday life everywhere, um, we might be attacking the symbols or the symptoms of that racism, but that is a huge intervention into um, uh, challenging the violence of every day. And um, if we think back of one year ago, uh, there was in Chile an uprising with 2 million people on the street. It was the reason why uh, the climate summit of the UN couldn't take place in Chile because there were uh, so many uh, movements coming together against neoliberalism, against uh, uh, the rising of public transport that was making it unaffordable. Uh, Mapuche uh, sovereignty, it all came together in these protests. People were shouting, it's not just about 30 cents, it's about 500 years. They were shouting, we know that the water is being taken by corporate entities. And so we can uh, see how these all fit together, our anti-racism and our environmental struggle. But unfortunately, this isn't sitting yet in the, in the big, um, uh, like big green. Um, just a final thought um, on our energy transition. Because even though, um, you know, working together with the force of wind and the force of solar 
is a super good thing and I think we can do so much more with it. We have to also really acknowledge the elephant in the room that it's not true that electric cars don't leave scars. They actually do. And the batteries or um, the huge um, copper and uh, magnets that go into wind uh, um, windmills, they're all based on extractivism. Um, neodymium, copper, lithium, and cobalt, that's usually mined in the global south. And once again, it goes hand in hand with uh, uh, military oppression, people being murdered, uh, child labor, slavery. And so again, if we don't speak out against it, what does it mean? It means that black lives don't matter. It means that uh, exploitation can go on as long as we can get uh, some new energy source. Um, so yeah, those are uh, some of my, my, my basic thoughts on um, the work that needs to be done to uh, strengthen um, the ability to work together as an as a environmental movement uh, with a strong anti-colonial, anti-racist uh, movement. And I think in our conversation around justice, um, we really need to see that there isn't just retributive justice, the justice that we know today of punishment in jails and arrests and um, taking stuff away. Um, there's also distributive justice. Um, this is what we know like uh, reparations or uh, 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 welfare or like making sure that there's some, uh, some equity or like some and then beyond that, there's restorative justice, which is about healing relationships that have been broken by harm. And then there's generative justice. And that's actually like creating a cycle of justice as a practice. Like uh, you see in, in Mexico in the milpa system uh, where uh, beans and squash and mice or corn is, is, is all cultivated together because it creates a beautiful cycle of nutrients for the soil and harvest and it creates a, a, a justice as practice and we see as we um, really look at the whole spectrum of justice as a practice that um, the more we move towards restorative and generative justice it becomes more participatory because in the first in retributive and distributive Usually the state is still the biggest agent or the courthouses or, and we don't have a chance to participate in it. And I think if we look at the full spectrum also in our climate justice and our uh, talks about system change, um, it becomes more participatory and really address the healing of relationships. And in those relationships, we should uh, address that even if shell is falling, like with the COVID, uh, there's been a huge dive for oil. Uh, justice is nowhere in sight. So we need to look beyond them falling and also look about like how we want them to fall and how we want to dismantle this monster. And it's when we talk about distributive justice, it's not just about getting a piece of the pie. It's also recognizing that there are some pies that we don't want to piece off because we don't want to um, join in on this extractivism. Um, and finally, we need to have the courage to really be political because sharing cute animal pictures is all good and fine. But if you're an oppressed person uh, in any of your oppressed identities, your life is always political because you bring that difference into the room. And so we need to have the courage to actually be political and acknowledge that Climate activism is political. Uh, our collective uh, um, activism is political uh, and stand by it. And this was just a slide to end with like, you, you're never an activist by yourself. Like just in this little introduction, I have used things that I've learned from like 10 different people on this slide. So uh, being in this movement for a long time, I think it's also really important to reflect on who are you learning from? Who are your sources? Because if you think to yourself and you don't have any book on your shelf or any movie you've seen by uh, black filmmakers or indigenous uh, writers or uh, scholars or activists or collectives, 
then you're really doing ourselves a dis dis um, service and also really think that who has taught you that if you are missing the insight of an Islamic uh, uh, academic, you're not missing much. Who has taught you that if you don't read these books, um, you're 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 not you know actually um, becoming more ignorant? So the this is also a way that racialization uh, turns up in in how we um, choose our knowledge and and. A lot of it is unlearning toxic knowledge, even in our own movement. And I think that would be um, the good point to take it to uh, the conversation of like, how do we do this movement work? And also make it so that, because the name of today is visibility politics. And I must confess, I've never known this term actually in activism in all those years. Um, and I'm also a little bit concerned that visibility politics, for as far as I understand it right now, um, can feed into both um, the neoliberal no notion that it's on the activist to be visible, um, and also just the idea of visibility politics sounds a little bit ableist to me, um, where, you know, just like the, the, the knowledge of science that has to be empirical, we focus all our sight on or all our our validation on visibility whereas you know there 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 are many other ways to to validate and also to trust into uh, the mystery of certain things um but that's opening a big can uh and maybe some other people in this conversation uh can also weigh in on that because i i'm actually quite, not quite sure what what that means um so happy to but i wanted to name it also because um i want to see if you also have concerns about ableism or neoliberalism sneaking in the back door like it can do also with diversity or inclusion like who gets to include and who's the includee like is that really the route that we want to go or want to challenge deeper and just say decolonize and let's do anti-oppression. Thank you, Chihiro. Um, now, I wonder if um, we can go back to the gallery. Okay, super. So I just wanna take this opportunity to um, invite those who are watching the live stream, please go ahead and um, send in questions because our, our panelists would love to answer them and engage with you. And so um, as your question, they'll come to me through the chat um, and, and I'm happy to direct them. Um, so Chihiro, I think that's great, um, a great way to, to start the conversation. Actually, there were so many points at which I was like, oh yes, let's talk about that. <laughs> um, and I think um, what you propose, these different, uh, different ideas of justice um, are, are crucial, a retributive, uh, okay, that's like just the beginning <laughs> and not even that necessarily, uh, not even the ambition of most activism, distributive, uh, generative. Um, and, and also the idea of justice as a practice. Um, and so I think what you're saying about, I understand, um, you know, the, the, what you, what you talk about, uh, the, about visibility and why, why does this have to be about visibility? This is, um, this is perhaps, um, ableist. Um, and I think, um, like as somebody, I'm an art historian, so, you know, I specialize in kind of the history of vision, um, but there, you know, there are certain trajectories, um, and of course it becomes multi-sensory, but also multimodal, the politicization of, uh, of vision, but also the ways we, uh, the ways we generate a sensibility for the world, right? Um, and I think, um, I, I wanted to, to mention this, um, so maybe we can go into um, the notion of uh, crisis imaginaries, which is the series, um, because I think that the uh, the imaginary is perhaps uh, less ableist uh, premise um, uh, than 
visibility politics because i think you're right that that if the that if the that if the ground is a visibility politics you're only just at the tip of the iceberg and it's already privilege right it's it's who gets to see what yeah. um i think um uh so I, the last exhibition, the last art exhibition that I saw uh, before the coronavirus lockdowns was, uh, was an exhibition at, uh, uh, in Brooklyn at PS1 called Theater of Operations, the Gulf Wars 1991 to 2011. Um, and it was a very sobering exhibition. Uh, it featured artists from Iraq, Iran, the Gulf War, as well as American artists. Um, and really it was a curatorial program that was demonstrating this ongoing American siege of the Persian Gulf, the brutal toll on people, on nation states, on the environment. I mean, it really was, there were so many images of oil fires um, and, the, and, the, and these forms of total destruction. But it also, um, and, and it really was nothing short of the genocide uh, by which uh, a country seizes oil uh, and gains global dominance. But what came from the artists was also a real comprehension of the, a, a real comprehension of the ideological spin of the politicians and corporations uh, and these, these covert, uh, covert war techniques. Um, and the techniques are not just, you know, kind of calling it a surgical strike as though it's very targeted when in fact, it's just like a, like a brutal total disaster. Um, but also the ways that this was crafted for the public. Um, and so the crafting of vision and attention, I think is, um, is really important. Uh, to understand, like it's, I mean, it clearly is a sophisticated way of thinking in the first place. And this is why there have to be disarticulations of the senses, disarticulations of especially attention. So I think, I think that that is, you know, the, the intention maybe behind talking about something like visibility politics is in some ways to give credit to these movements that are suddenly getting, to my mind, as far as I can tell, getting huge public momentum. And so, um, and so I'm, I'm glad for that, but maybe um, you could speak a little bit about the ambitions of your activism, because I think when I see, say, Chihiro standing at the mic at the Shell annual meeting, you are, in a sense, trying to, um, trying to pull and to shift the attention, and you need to get visibility to do it. And so it's not just about kind of uh, identities, who gets to, you know, who gets to, you know, get the, you know, steal the spotlight, but you're, you're of course, speaking about more fundamental changes. Um, and so maybe I could just, maybe I could just open up the discussion and um, uh, you can all open up your mic and, and um, uh, speak about uh, how you hope to claim the imaginary, the public imaginary, how you see to engage it and, wh and what that means to you, the, the kind of the control of the imaginary that um, is it, is it the government, is it corporations, is it the public, who do you direct your interventions to? Mm -hmm. Um, for me, uh, I spend a lot of time actually, um, directing my efforts and my attention to words, uh, people who are already in the realm of wanting to do something, uh, who already share the values, but are, are lacking ways of making that next step into activism or, a stepping up their activism into from uh, CO2 to anti-oppression. And I find that for me working the best because um, I wanna amplify our capacity to make a, make a difference. And I feel that I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to be on TV in a toxic, uh, environment that is just out there to displace me and and frame me wrong like I'm happy to work with other activists to create another frame uh, in its own right uh, that can inspire more people to have the courage to believe in the collective because that's another thing I think our activism as we come into an active 
an activism. We're not born an activist. Um, you, you only learn by, by doing. It's a muscle. And the more you use it, you know, the more you, you become more fluent in what you really stand for and how you articulate it. And I think one of the, the, the challenges in that muscle is that all of our lives we've been trained uh, to think as individuals, as consumers, as producers, which all undermine our humanity um, and our to solve things collectively that the individual cannot solve. Like there's a lot of things that I as an individual do not have um, deciding power over. Like if we talk about the war, uh, you know, with the war against Iraq, there were 36 million people out on the street, like protesting, but still that was really hard, you know, because they have the bombs and uh, the money. And so I think we need a lot of collectivity, but all our lives we've been trained not to believe in a collective. So I think my attention or my audience goes into triggering the imaginaries, people who already want to, but just, you know, have trouble with becoming part of a collective activist, courageous, uh, creative uh, body working together. Um, so yeah, th those are my first five cents in the in the bucket. Uh, happy to hear. Uh, I think like, yeah, uh, for Aki, I already know a little bit, but Asuka, I'm very curious also like, who, who do you, who's your first target? Uh, I think that's quite a difficult question to answer, to be honest, um, because it's kind of constantly changing. Um, I think, but right now, I think it's mainly people who are already active, activists, uh, especially in the climate movement, um, but who are like, who right now have just a view of, okay, we need to protect the climate, who, who have just like this, uh, just the environmental view on the topic um, because that are mainly the persons I'm working with right now and so everything I do right now especially inside of the Fridays for Future movement uh, is focusing on changing the mindset um, of the people and how they look at problems like if they're just um, I'm, I'm, try I'm trying to lead them to um, yeah, recognizing what's below the problem so that they're not only scratching the surface, that they're not only seeing, oh, the carbon emissions are rising, but they're questioning, but that they're questioning, okay, why why are they rising? Like, of course, because some, um, yeah, I think that's obvious, but what's the historical and political uh, mechanism behind it? Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm mainly focusing on mainly white activists who have like a very privileged view on a lot of topics. Um, yeah, so that they can like think more intersectionally. Uh, I think that are like the main targets of what I'm doing right now. Um, yeah, and I think that, I, I think this is gonna uh, be this way for quite a time right now because I think it's gonna take a long, long time. Uh, yeah, to be really hurt inside of movement and for the persons to recognize what what people like me say to them that they um, listen to us um yeah but i think that is like my main target right now rocky do you want to weigh in oh your mic your mic <laughs> thank you there you go. Sorry. Yeah, I think I, I, I'm in the same line as, as uh, uh, Brother Zuka uh, uh, because my first target, uh, target uh, are the, those who say they care about the environment, right? Those who wanted to stop climate change. Those are the ones who should um, support this indigenous perspective and understand this very well, that this is the most obvious way to prevent or stop further climate destruction. Uh, if you know it, look at the numbers with some the most crucial numbers I've I've seen out of the reports, uh, which which is the most effective way to to stop climate change. And I think if you if I may zoom in into the the, the words of cri crisis imaginaries and visibly politics and climate justice, you know, the main problem of these words are is that 
for example, the people in West Papua, but a lot of people in the global south and the indigenous peoples don't have the platforms and the podium to express their views. And that's the problem. The institutes um, in, in the modern world and, in, in, you know, in, in the global north are the ones who, who say what we have to know. And this is the exact problem. The silence of the global north are at the root is, is the main, main reason why we came into the climate crisis, because we don't care about what happened to the people in the global south. It's so if you look at the crisis imaginaries, if those were of the people, of the indigenous peoples or people in the global south, we could prevent a lot of destruction in the first place. So this is important. Who is sending what? Who is writing what down? What are we telling to the world via the UN, via governments, via the media, educational levels? And I think this is, this is the problem and the challenge we have. And so the, my first target are environmental organizations who say they want to protect env uh, forest, who wanted to protect biodiversity. They should start listening to indigenous peoples, the ones who protect this forest and biodiversity with their lives for more than a century. And still we aren't being heard. That is my perspective. Because if I haven't seen them in West Papua for the last 60 years and still my people are being killed to this day. And want it to, to hook in, in what Sister Chiro said, indeed, what we can't afford to be apolitical. If you look at the years that the scientists are giving us, 10 years and less now, it's, it's an illusion to say we must be able, we need every day, every second to point out at the root causes and apolitical is not one of them because it's about colonialism on indigenous lands. It's about capitalism by greed corporations and racism against indigenous peoples and people in the global south. These are the elements we should point out and be fearless and we need every day to, to understand what we have to deal with. And, it, and these are the elements you know, I want to highlight. So yes, my first targets are our friends, but the second targets are of course the institutes who ignored these voices and, and stories for more than centuries. I'm going to bundle uh, two questions that have come in. Um, and I'm just, uh, the only reason I'm bundling them is because I think uh, they can intersect. So uh, the first one is from uh, Joel Levto. And um, Joel says, I think one of your panelists already mentioned this, but do they find it frankly neo-colonialist to be talking about the climate movement as new um, and the youth leading it mm -hmm. since black indigenous and people of color have been leading this fight for so long um, and so um, and so that's uh, one question uh, and then another question from secret mainstream uh, visibility seems to denote a relationship to mediating parties how are things made more or less visible and to whom uh, do the panelists see more value in changing public opinion uh, or direct action and so um, I'll I'll leave it at, uh, at that. But I but part of it is is you know how do we even imagine the climate movement itself? Is it new? Um, is it you know uh, obviously um, it's you know centuries in the making. Um, but but what is wrong with perceiving it as new? What is right about perceiving it as new? I mean I, I have some thoughts about that too. Um, and um, but of course what are the risks of, of seeing the unprecedented nature of climate change? And then uh, this issue of visibility. Is it about changing public opinion? Is it about changing the way we perceive or is it about direct action or both? Chiro, would you start? Or uh, I always have thoughts. I just thought I won't be a mic grabber. <laughs> <laughs> no, be, be, be a mic grabber, please. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I uh, deeply, uh, deeply think we shouldn't brand ourselves as new. I understand why it's happening because the media um, doesn't put anything on, on a page if it's not news and news kind of um uh requires it to be something different than yesterday um so i understand it from a media perspective or a news perspective that people constantly try to innovate themselves into rebranding themselves as new 
But I think here's what you, what goes missed, and it's not just that it's historically false um, and it erases people, but also we're, we're missing so much of our ancestral power. Like when I read uh, amazing insights from like, um, I was reading a quote yesterday from Standing, uh, Luther Standing Bear, let me just check this. Um, yeah, Luther Standing Bear. We did not think of the great open plains, the beautiful rolling hills and the winding streams with tangled um, growth as wild. Only, the white man was, uh, only to the white man was nature a wilderness and only to him was the land infested by wild animals and savage people. To us, it was tame, earth was bountiful, and we were surrounded with the blessings of the great mystery. Not until the hairy man from the east came, and with brutal frenzy heaped injustices upon us and the families we loved, was it wild for us. When the very animals of the forest began fleeing from his approach, then it was that for us the Wild West begun. And in this tiny quote from like more than a century ago, you have a total reframe. You have a reframe of, of uh, what the world, a uh, word wilderness means, what nature means, what uh, reverence uh, for home and, 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 and the natural home is. And I think um, when we miss that, we miss a lot. Um, and what every movement needs is um, the understanding of legitimacy. And I think nothing legitimizes as, uh, us as much as a movement as the power of, our, of, of, of Earth Defenders before us and the harm that has already been done as a crime to stop. And the idea that the idea of the future and abstract or our children is more powerful than millions of black and brown people and white people who have already laid down their lives to protect home. I find that we are already alienated so much from the value of life that we're, we're missing. We're missing our strong legitimacy. Um, so, so that's that's on the first question. Uh, I'll let other people speak, and then I'll get to the second question. <laughs> Azuka, you first, or okay? Um, yeah, uh, I think like as being part of a group, which probably is one of the main reasons the climate movement right now is proclaimed as being new and uh, by the youth and the youth being leading it. Um, yeah, I gotta say that's kind of bullshit. Uh, I have to say it this way because it's like we just have the attention of the media right now. Um, it's nothing else. It's like the climate movement is anything but new. Um, you can say like kind of the modern by a dominated by climate movement which is dominated by white people is new but saying the climate movement as a whole is new would be totally wrong as there have been uh, fights against ecocide for over like 500 years by indigenous people um it's just they haven't got the attention um of the media of like the global population or especially of the population of the western population um and like the only thing which is new is the attention we get right now because it's a new group it's like people are standing up for something um in a way that didn't happen before it's like the privileged people are now standing up and that's the thing that's changing so it's not like the protests are new it's just new who is participating in this protest and that is changing the way society sees these protests um and that's something we have to realize uh because it's also a common mistake made in our movement that people from uh in fridays for future are saying like we are leading this movement and like we are the top of it everything we do is like important for every other movement like we have to decide everything it's it's just like a very very ignorant perspective which undermines the work which has been done uh, during the past hundreds of years um and yeah 
it's just our privilege that is the privilege we are having, which is leading to this new, um, yeah, this, the new framing of this climate movement. And it's definitely our work to change it um, because we are right now in a position to, position to change it. And come to the second question, uh, if it's more important to change public opinion or to have direct action, I think you need both. Um, I think you have to change the public opinion to a certain degree before you can go on with direct act, with direct act, direct action, um, and I think right now we are, or like Fridays for Future especially, is at a point where we did change the public opinion, at least in a couple of countries like Germany, to such a degree that we can say a major part of yeah of the people are like behind this uh, climate protection topic, and now with this attention. And like with this public opinion we have, we have now to continue to um, amplify the voices of the people who have been ignored for so long. And it's like, we have to, we have to have change the public opinion to a certain degree uh, so that people will listen to us so that we are not just like a small movement, um, which are like, yeah, I know, kind of irrelevant, but something which is socially accepted. And now with this power we gained, we can go on with direct action because now we don't, well, we still have to fear it, but it's not such a danger that um, the police or the military or will shut us down. Like they can't ignore for right now because we've come to the middle of the society. So from this perspective, I think direct, direct action is the way to go for a movement like Fridays for Future, um, because we can do it, we have to do it. We're not, yeah, we're not facing big dangers through it. Um, so we have to take more steps and continue with what we with, than to continue with the things we do right now. But because we reached what we can with this way of protest, in my opinion. And, and now we have to change the topics uh, we're talking about. We have to uh, bring in a much wider perspective to the things we're talking about. And we kind of need, need to take the next step from being just the peaceful marching children to a movement which really has the power to change the society by the things it does and not only by the things it says. Okay. <clears throat> Yes, I um, answer on question one for me would be yeah, new in that sense that uh, we can see a lot of youth um, uh, protesting, uh, school striking and hitting the streets. Uh, that's the new thing in, in the climate change uh, movement from my side. And if you look at movements like Extinction Rebellion, we can see, you know, a, a variation in ages from youngsters to oldsters all joining. So from my point of view, I think it's, you know, um, it's something positive I want to underline and I want to highlight it from my personal experiences the last two years as indigenous climate activists in the Netherlands is that, yes, of course, it's not perfect, but we cannot afford us as humanity to let us play out of each other. Um, uh, if we have 10 years time to solve this crisis, but we have to learn each other that this new, you know, uh, mostly white climate change activist must understand the faults that have been um, the faults that have been made in the past by previous, you know, uh, um, climate change activists, by politicians, by environmental organizations, that we do not make the same mistakes again. And we have to include the most important perspective which brought us into this climate crisis in the first place. I think something we can only do that by working together. And that is what I've done the last two years. Yes, it's not perfect, but I'm really pleased that movements such as Extinction Rebellion, fossil free, um, uh, fossil free uh, culture or fossil free uh, movement, um, the Netherlands, Shell Must Fall, uh, Animal Rebellion, uh, Fridays for Future in the Netherlands, give me the opportunity to tell my story on behalf of the indigenous peoples of Papua. This is a change I support and I'm welcoming because we cannot afford to not work together, but because the corporations such as Shell, BP, and these governments are working together to across borders. So it would be a huge historical mistake 
for us to not work together, but we have to learn. We have to bring all this perspective together. And that's the only way we can solve this climate crisis. And, and, and I hope that, you know, the, the leading figures, such as my warrior queen, Greta Thunberg, who got a lot of media uh, exposure, to not forget those who, who have lost their lives and balanced our Earth's biodiversity, to give them the, 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 the floor they deserve. For example, the people of West Papua, who've been ignored for more than 60 years, we have the solution, but we do not get the exposure we deserve. And that is something I hope climate change activists in a privileged position uh, should, should uh, understand the challenge we have. And we cannot uh, um, keep out important perspective in this. And we have to work together. And I'm very optimistic about the changes we've done by working together in the Netherlands, highlighting the injustice in West Papua on their uh, um, um, you know, media um, uh, media platforms uh, that we can strengthen each other. And that is that is something, you know, our opponents don't like and exactly what we have to do. Yeah, Chihiro. Yeah, I want to add to that. Um, so on the question of um, direct action or public opinion, I'm, I, I am, uh, I was just checking if I was muted. Um, I would say direct action, but I would also say direct action is not only shutting down a mine, even though that is something that I think we need to do more of. Mm -hmm. Direct action is also an art performance in a museum that is sponsored by Shell. Direct action is also um, putting in uh, a, a, a mozi uh, in parliament uh, in a way that you are not waiting for other people to grant you things. You're actually having uh, enough courage to put things into action yourself in your own right. And I think this is really needed in a, in a movement to have um, uh, in, enough rootedness uh, that you have uh, a strong practice to move the needle because uh, oppression is not a matter of misunderstanding. Uh, there are people that are, uh, like if we look at the spectrum of left wing and right wing, um, traditionally right wing are very comfortable and believe in hierarchical societies. Like that's what the whole left and right uh, began with, like in the French Revolution, when the people on the left wanted an opening on more democratic or egalitarian society, and the people on the right wanted the old hierarchy. So, of course, the, the left was limited because they didn't include everybody, everybody, and the right was still protecting the hierarchy of, you know, like old power system. But the basic difference is like, hierarchy or broadening of, of rights. And so if we understand that there are these um, power struggles and it's not a misunderstanding, then it really is up to activists to build up enough capacity to make that change because what is legal isn't always what's just. And most of the time, you know, with all of the oppression, it's never just. So I do think we need enough uh, courage to build up practice of direct action uh, also beyond what might be legal like if you look with COVID again in the U.S. it's stupid to use all these examples from the U.S. but in COVID time there was just like three states that pushed through um, uh, laws that would make it illegal to do direct action uh, against infrastructure of like pipelines and stuff. Um, so you can make it illegal, but that doesn't make it less needed. Like if we look at Naomi Klein's book of years back, it said we needed to diminish 10% uh, every year of, of global emissions. Now with this, you know, like even with COVID and everything, we're not gonna hit 10% probably. So we need more <laughs> reductions in terms of, um, of polluting industries than even in a year where so much has been shut down is happening. And we've been lagging for like, not just a few years, but decades. Um, so I do really 
put my faith into uh, uh, an accumulation of direct action, but direct action that isn't alien from movements. So it's not just a few people, you know, the avant-garde, we are the revolution and the rest just follow us. But it is a movement that as an intergenerational uh, movement can move has the strength of the experience of people who are already in it for a long time and the courage of new people and new energy that pushes it where it hasn't gone before and I think if we are intergenerational we can do direct action better as well with more resources and intelligence. Yes, I, I have uh, two questions on um, on the docket here, um, but I think, you know, I, I, what I hear from all of you is, I mean, clearly this is not just a matter of uh, public opinion, but of just changing the way we think altogether, and that that, uh, that the actions that bring about that kind of change are, are not just, I mean, obviously they're not just uh, um, a kind of stereotype of what protest action is, but actually need these need different modalities. Um, but but also, I mean, we're dealing with uh, co uh, corporations and governments that are um, acting outside of the law. We're talking about murder. We're talking about genocide. We're talking, you know, the law can't even catch up. And so, the question of what the action is to counteract that. Uh, to bring about justice um, becomes super complex. Um, and I think you're, all, of, all of the organizations we've been talking about are working in these sophisticated ways. Um, and so um, the, uh, the, the, the outcome of collective action and you know, this kind of spanning of individual experience and knowledge with, uh, with a collective action um, is pretty riveting as a form, um, and, but, but so much more than, uh, than sort of visibility as we started talking about it. Um, so a question from uh, Evie. Um, when we're talking, uh, when we're thinking about who we are learning from in climate activism, how do we avoid tokenization as we try to elevate the voices of indigenous and people of color? Um, I think this is this is a good question because I mean, as we've already been, you know, as as Rocky said, okay, the, so many people in the global south do not have the podium. Not only that, um, I think, you know, Chihiro, what you're pointing to is the media, the the media podium um, is already is already loaded in so many ways from the start. And so, actually, the activism is to give voice to people that uh, voice visibility, the sphere of the imaginary. To, to try and uh, send, uh, send those voices um, uh, towards that podium, but also to change the way we see, change the lens altogether. And then there's this issue of tokenization. I mean, how can you in good conscience give that, uh, give that space, uh, give that attention without it being totally diffracted by, um, by, that, uh, by that media apparatus? Um, so what are you, what are some thoughts about that? And, and is that perhaps, um, not even the issue for you? <laughs> like you have to do it anyway. <laughs> Asuka, you want to talk to like, if people approach you, like in a, in a way that you feel like tokenized, how do you, how do you respond to that in your activism? Mm, I usually, um, just decline the thing they they come to me with is like uh i do often have the feeling to be tokenized in my own movement and for the future um it's like when when i get like um yeah in interviews or something an interview is guided to me uh, which was initially planned uh, for someone else um sometimes it's just like okay they're seeing who i am they see my competences and think that i can manage it but sometimes it also has just a feeling like okay they want a a uh, person of color in the media just to have the feeling to that Fridays for Future isn't only white and that's like um, that's that's when I have to feel like I, I'm put uh, yeah in the media or, or like on social media on the press doesn't matter but just mm, that Fridays for Future can appear more diverse than it actually is um, and, and if something like that happens, I'm just like, okay, nope, I'm not going to do this. 
I'm not going to step out in the media. I'm not going to step out just so you can feel better about it. That's not my job. That's not the thing I'm going to do. And if someone is come to me with that approach, I'm usually just going to start discussion about it and tell them why I'm not going to do this, try to, try to change their mind. Um, yeah, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's like, but I try to avoid it as good as I can. Um, yeah, to be kind of used in that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose the, the issue is that uh, you don't want to take the pressure off you know, by making people feel feel good. Like there, that that is the, the worry of tokenization that, okay, you've had this, it's okay now, it's okay. Um, and, and that is against the entire, I mean, that actually diffuses the, me the momentum of the movement. I think because, um... So let me answer it first personally. Uh, for me, I've been in the movement for many years where even though I had a story to tell, there would be no mic available whatsoever. So even in the groups that I was operating in, if it came time to have a, you know, like a conference and there would be many talks and there would be one about climate and I'd say, yes, I can talk about that and be like, you know, nobody would ask me. And so for many years, I just, you know, was alone with my books. And I was just reading more and more and more and getting so hyper charged up so that I could, you know, fight in, you know, like how the our, our right wing politician here talks about how uh, immigrants need to fight their way in. But that's not really what he means. But he means that, you know, you need to assimilate into the, 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 the society, but I was kind of doing that, like just hypercharging my arguments and my, my polishing and reading. And so when the time came that I was invited, even if I was tokenized, I was like, okay, I'll use it. <laughs> and I'll just bring the most radical point of view because in the end, I think that radical um, perspective can help uh front and center people that are being erased. Um, but it's now come to a point where uh, I can, I, 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 I notice more that people want to use me as uh, an address book to other people of color. And then I really have <laughs> to see like, you know, what is the integrity of this request? And I think the integrity is mostly like, how much have you invested in building relationship? Um, so if you like, if, if you're a person with all good intentions, but you're worried, like, I don't want to tokenize somebody, then I would advise, like, just have lots of coffee, um, uh, not ask people for their knowledge over coffee and exploit their free emotional labor, but have coffee without an agenda just to get to know people, like show up at their events, um, learn from them. And so you actually, um, by the time that you know, you might want to ask something of them. Um, you have a relationship. So like the other day I was requested on a podcast by three different people and two of them wrote this half messy message on Facebook to me. And one of them I knew pretty well. And we've had a process of working together on some climate racism uh, workshops. And so it, then I will call her back. I will ask like, Hey, what did you, what do you really want? And, you know, maybe it's better if I'm not a speaker, but I can, if you wrote the script for it, I can look at it and maybe give you some, some input. So if you have relationship as a container, then you have trust both ways to also critique certain things without it completely going bust. Um, so yeah, I think relationship and also understanding that environmental activism is about changing relationship with earth and others so then all this investment in relationship isn't um isn't an, an investment on returns it's just healing bits of yourself as well that is so alienated because we all grow up in a society that is so alienated so it's just seeing it as healing work rather than in 
production. Like, don't make other people who've already done disproportionate emotional labor and faced different ways of micro or physical or other oppressions um, do more work for you uh, from a extractivist point of view. Rocky. I think uh, you know it's 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 something we have to be uh, always um, aware of. But for myself, uh, on a personal level, I'm not afraid that it will happen to me, and this is why uh, I will never let uh, somebody dictate me what to say, uh, because I know the power and uh, the importance of my story and the perspective of the indigenous people. So that is something you know. It's, it's I think it's an Im individual responsibility but it is not it is something which obviously will happen somewhere else against somebody else even in my own community and, and to, to give an example there's a huge u.s environmental organizations who's using west papuan representative diplomats um, highlighting the west papua as the first ever conservational province in the world it's a nonsense and i tag them during a recent invitation at the Global Landscape Forum in Germany bon, last year, where they invited me as well. Um, and they dictated me to say, you know, your speech has to be apolitical. I say, obviously, I say yes, but at the moment on stage, I hit them with truth because I ignored the dictates about being apolitical by this organization. So it happens to people from my own, you know, um, um, uh, background. But the challenge is, for every, you know, indigenous or global South people is to make sure that you will always tell your story. There's no negotiation about that. So that's, you know, only that in that way you can prevent tokenization. And I won't allow any individual organization to downsize the most crucial perspective to tackle climate change, which is the indigenous perspective. And and it's not very complex. My, my, my reach out to climate activists is to be fearless because that's the only reason we have and moral and ethical against you know, other organizations who are trying to bring them close to you and still keeping this you know, radical perspective out of them. And this is something I want to encourage all my brothers and sisters in privileged position, in, in, in new movements such as Extinction Rebellion, Fossil Free, whatever, to be truthful to yourself and understand the timeline the scientists are giving us, which is 10 years time. And to the NGOs and environmental organizations, I want them to look in the mirror, understanding the numbers of the scientists, which states we have just a few years to tackle irreversible destruction of crucial ecosystems. And we can't be apolitical. We must be fearless and take a more responsibility, bringing all this perspective together and it's simple. When the numbers are saying that indigenous people are protecting 80% of world's biodiversity, protecting the forest we need, even if we downsize the carbon emissions, we need this forest. It means that they should bring this perspective onto the decision-making table. How is it possible that fossil fuel companies are sitting with politicians, with government, making decisions about the environment that they have destructed for centuries, and indigenous people are still not on the table? And this is the responsibility of environmental organizations, politicians, and but also our responsibility as climate activists to make sure that they, we won't uh, allow this to happen. Rocky, I'm going to quickly follow up with a question that is directed to yep. you. Um, this is from Lee Shinjie, and, and uh, Lee Shinjie says for Rocky, can you give an example of how to unfold the intricate relationship between politics, human rights, and climate activism to global North organizations from an indigenous perspective? And so it's, it's to sort of keep going with the question of, of the indigenous perspective specifically and how how, um, how to, um, I mean, the, the, the question is how to unfold the intricate relationship, but I, but I think what you are saying, um, uh, especially about getting the perspective on the table, um, is, is, uh, is at stake here, yeah. I, perfect question, thank you very much. Um, and I think I, there are some very positive signs. And for those who haven't read the, the European um, uh, uh, Biodiversity strategy launched last month. It's part of the Green Deal in, in EU. 
I want to ask you to read it. And it's a, it's a beautiful, uh, there's a beautiful, a beautiful sentences in it, which is underlying the importance of respecting and pl- protecting indigenous peoples uh, um, as, 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 as first um, solutions to, to prevent further destruction of the climate, um, uh, the environmental crisis in the world we, we face today. And at the same time, I think it's very important for us as indigenous peoples to make sure that we knock on every door and if they don't want to open, we will kick it open. That's exactly what I'm doing. So they can't avoid us anymore because this perspective must be there on every level, which is on, you know, educational level, environmental level or political decision making. We must be sitting on the table. And that is my own responsibility. I take and I encourage, you know, all the activists to join me because it is very, they say it's complex. It's not complex because it's about hearing these voices because me, for, for to, to give an example, West Papuans know very good how to protect the forest. We don't need scientists to tell us how to preserve or conservate the forest. We know we did, did it for centuries. So it's about, you know, taking us serious. We, and, and for the indigenous people of West Papua, it's, this, it's our only agenda is to decolonize the country. So we take control of our land. We take control of what we want to destroy or not. And we take control of the third largest rainforest in the world. It's that simple. And it is environmental organizations and NGOs to make sure that we can decide what is good for us and not dictate us. And what, you know, for the West Papuan case, this is the solution. For the people in the Amazon, or, or it could be land rights, for the people in, you know, and talk to them. They can give you an answer and we should facilitate them, give them the platforms, let them use the networks they have. And that is something, you know, which is actually very simple. It's not that complex. They say it's complex, which is not. It's just listening to them and facilitate them in the needs, they, in, the, in, in the things they need. I, as a resource, um, and this is perhaps speaking to the uh, to the earlier question, but to this one as well, um, uh, at indigenousaction.org, there's a wonderful statement. Um, in, a, in a sense, it's a denouncement of allyship. And so I, as um, a, a, a settler environmental thinker, um, had been using this concept of, I, of allyship and thinking of that as a, as a perspective from which to, uh, from which to speak from from which to uh, to theorize uh, and from which to take action, but this um, this statement was. Um, in, in a sense, suggesting that allyship, it was challenging the notion of allyship and the relationships that are implied, uh, but it proposed the notion of accomplice. And, and I liked, and, and so in this statement, um, it was suggesting that uh, the need for, um, uh, for, for accomplices, but that would be to um, to, to uh, take action together, um, and that's the thing that counts. Um, and so, in some ways, it's um, I think there it, it is absolutely crucial to build long term relationships. But that also there is there is this political domain that demands for accomplices, um, and that counts too. And that and that both again, this is this is not an either or, um, but this is a long standing. Um, but also active uh, kind of thinking. So we have another question here um, from Animesh uh, Guatam. How can the global media be decolonized in a way that it exercises and embodies inclusivity? Excellent question. (laughs) As it poisons our brain every day. I think sometimes... um, while we need to uh, decolonize the, the, the media, the, 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 the nation states and everything, there's also a particular notion that the media that we have right now and nation states as an entity are so toxic that um, the way we actually help them is by creating other pathways, creating pluriversity, um, also kind of diffusing their power by um, validating other uh, ways that in which we have more space to be radical anti-oppression. And by doing that, um, we strengthen movement and ourselves and um, love into our community in such a way that we are able to raise the resistance that then push 
mainstream media into places that it never thought it could go. And I think we really see that happening with uh, the amazing uh, organizing of um, Black Lives Matter um, and how defund the police you know, a year ago, you know, you would find that notion with radical activists, but to put that on a mainstream panel, let alone on TV, was just not conceivable. And even early on in like May or in June, um, I remember that um, somebody was asked to speak on an item actually in Canada and in the little pre-interview, uh, uh, she she was asked about something and she talked about defund the police and the producer was like, oh yeah, so actually we ha still have to talk to a few other people for this item and we'll let you know. And of course she was never asked on again. And the fact that she, that you know, they just can't do it anymore. It's like everywhere really goes to show that activism works, um, but activism works not in, in a capitalist linear way. So the frustration is, you know, with so many people that they, you know, have to put a lot and lot, a lot of effort and don't see any change until this moment of like, boom, change not happening in a nonlinear way and seeing that we're talking about defunding the police. And I think we should be talking about defunding the military um, and really understanding that if we want to tackle uh, these things, we have to build the movements to a point where they're that strong. And the movements need uh, storytelling as well. So if it doesn't get it from the mainstream media, it needs enough channels to, to have that, that critical uh, media of itself. And then it also builds up the muscle to then when finally you have the media say like, oh shit, we have to deal with this, um, we'll put in a little diversity clause that you have people that are already trained in alternative media to take up those spots with enough muscle to actually hold their ground. Because once, you know, uh, the changing process always needs you to, to be so strong, you know, and it's, it's, it's not something you do overnight. So I think having, having more, um, I mean, pluriversity in, in general is just uh, what we're aiming for, not just as a process, but as a result, right? We don't want this one monolithic um, powerhouse of the media to, to dominate all. So it's also a way of building up that muscle um, and decolonize it from, from the grassroots up. Rocky, do you have... Uh... Yes, I think um, I think that's the, the biggest challenge, right? To decolonize the media, to make sure that these these voices of the global south, of the unheard, get the the attention they deserve. But I'm I'm I think I'm hopeful, and I think the thing we we, we should do is to make sure that our friends, right? So the environmental organizations who say they're on our side, to use their power and their funds to do the right thing, and ex give the example in the first place by uh, those who you know have not been heard and those who are on the front lines of protecting the things we care uh, and to give them the floor they deserve. I think that should be a, a first uh, um, a focus that our friends take the lead by giving the example and to create this mass, um, mass mobilizations which we see now with the BL uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement all across the world that we are dominating news because we are that big, right? And I think, you know, the climate crisis is like the biggest threat. Our planet is on fire, our house is on fire. So we have to, you know, keep up to find the momentum to work together. All this different movement, whether it is anti-racism, climate change or the pandemic threats, it's all interconnected. And, and we must understand that. So as movement, what I'm doing from, from my organization, I'm collaborating with all kinds of movements. And I have experienced the power of what we've done the last two years' time. To give an example, for those who don't, doesn't, don't believe it, if you look at West Papua, 10 years ago, nobody knew about it. The last 10 years, in a country where we have no freedom, with, which is very oppressed, with very little resources, we have created change, defeating the oppressor, defeating these corporations and the governments who wanted to keep this a secret. We have changed the, 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 the awareness in the region 
Last year, we got 79 states demanding a UN human rights fact-finding mission to West Papua. This is the change we've realized from such a position. So I am confident that if we are willing to work together in an independent country such as the Netherlands, with organizations, with those who want it, we can create the change. Asuka. Uh, yeah, I think I have nothing to add here, to be honest, um, especially because this is a question I haven't been confronted with or yeah, that much um, till now, to be honest, um, because I personally haven't been in the position that I have to like accumulate um, this attention of media on this, yeah, on the struggles uh, I've been fighting for. Um, what probably is because I started in a movement which already had like this main the attention of the mainstream media um, at the time I started. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I think that definitely is a thing I have to um, yeah confront myself with um, and to think more about. Um, yeah, because I actually never did before. One thing I can okay. add, and yes. that's just a small hack, but I think uh, with like what Black Lives Matter does or Shell Must Fall is putting in the name what you actually want. And I think that's a really good way because every time any news or any media has to write about you, you are seeding your vision, you know, like, in, 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 in like to validate black lives in a, in a culture of white supremacy, that's an act of rebellion every time it gets written down. And to uh, write down shell must fall in a country that still celebrates uh, colonial shell, you know, enter for its entrepreneurial blah, 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 uh, at the expense of uh, thousands of lives lost um, is, uh, a radical act that every time you see it, shall must fall, shall must fall, that becomes a reality. And in that way, we're also um, reprogramming. <laughs> so I think in that sense, we should uh, be smart with our names in the way that our enemy also does that. You know, like if you look at on the UN level, you have these projects of clean coal. It's like no such thing as clean coal, but by calling it every time in a report, they'll start writing it. Or like, you know, the Green Deal. There are many things about that deal that's like the European one. It is just co-opted from like the Green New Deal and putting it there, but putting a, a, a thought in people's minds when they read it every time. And I think in that way, um, it's just a little thing, but in those little things, you can you can be very creative. Okay, I have one more question, and I think um, I, I'm very interested in this question, and I think I'm going to set up the question with a quote that I had. Um, I'm cognizant of, um, we've got about 12 minutes left and I wanted to get this one in there um, because I think it's a good starting point. So, I mean, I have to say that um, when I was watching Chihiro's um, videos, you know, I was so impressed by the way that you were able to track a history, the history of Shell back to an originary scene of, uh, uh, colonial violence, murder. You talked about. Um, uh, you talked about uh, the Congo. You talked about, um, and and in pretty visceral terms. So, indigenous people being forced to labor for the profit uh, of. In this case, it was Labor II. And and you know, or have their limbs cut off, or have their children killed. Uh, when Rocky is speaking, he's speaking about the murder of uh, West Papuans, one third of the population, um, and also his father. Um, and so there's a way that um, this, this toll, accepting that, hearing that, um, is, is, is essential to understanding, to changing minds. And so if you'll, if you'll entertain me, I had a quote from, uh, from my colleague at UCL, uh, Catherine Yusoff, who writes this book, A Billion Black Anthropocenes, 
all or nothing. And this is not a quote from that book, but it, it, it's another um, article on loss uh, and extinction. And she says, uh, not, just the, not just conceived as the flip side of care, the acknowledgement of violence can be a starting point for taking stock of it, of being conscious of the scope and impact of harm, and thus of thinking about ways in which this can become recognized and reduced. Um, while this kind of violence is prohibited in the public domain as unhelpful and sometimes against the very lives and liveliness that are being presented for consideration, violence continues apace. Why is it that we trust the efficacy of beauty, non-human charisma, animal magnetism, vibrant matter, the wild poetic movement, but do not yet want to trust the efficacy of violence? Violence is mentioned sometimes briefly, and then we move on to other more life affirming things, more positive, actionable configurations out of the predicament, but yet we move further into it. Um, and so, uh, so that's the quote, um, and it's, it's a curiosity for me. I, I, I think it's pretty essential. But then we have this question from Evie, and she says, uh, Chihiro already mentioned emotional labor, but how do the panelists manage the emotional investment and exhaustion of being climate activists, particularly for Asuka as the youngest guest? So maybe uh, we can start with Asuka, um, but I, I would like to hear from all of you. Uh, I think that's quite a difficult thing. Um, and it's definitely a thing I'm watching all over, especially younger activists that, that they burn out, that they break down, that they have mental breakdowns constantly um, because of the yeah, emotional investment and exhaustion from it. Um, because like, because of this, yeah, feeling of we can't really do anything, whatever we do, it doesn't have an impact. It's like, like maybe uh, yeah, pessimistic, but um, how I or how I watch a lot of people handle it, um, I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, because it's a thing I'm still trying to figure out because I'm, for myself, definitely experience these kind of exhaustion from what they do um but i think the key point is to not like put too much pressure on myself um because it's like the feeling that you have constantly to do more and more that you have to do put more effort more time into it uh, to actually receive anything it's like this mindset of you have to do everything you possibly can to change it. Can be very motivating and can lead to great work, I think, but it also can be very, very destructive. So I think it's very, very important to, all, to have the thoughts, to push your limits and boundaries, but still have to recognize yourself as a living body that you have still have some needs you have to um, fulfill to, con uh, to, co to continue this work. So I'm trying, what I'm trying is to give myself like the time slot every day of like two or three hours where I don't spend my time on this work or also not on school, not on climate activism, but just on the things, uh, on my hobbies, like doing sport or doing art or something. Um, so I can just like recover, like also mentally, but also physically um, from the stress uh, from the rest of the day. Um, and I think, everybody needs to find a balance between the work they do and the time they take off because you're not helping anybody and not your fight if you break down by yourself. It's like, as long as you function, you can continue. But if you stop to function, if your body stops to function, if your mind stops to function, you're not um, bringing your fights forward. And that's like the thing I try to keep in mind um, to stop myself from like breaking myself. Uh, yeah. Haki. Yes. Um, thank you for the question. I think from, for my personally, it is a desire to, everyday mm -hmm. desire to help 
my people and stop the injustice which is happening there. For it's a personal struggle for me the, because the loss of my father, uh, assassinated by the Indonesian military. So his death, I transformed the you know the 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 the, the sorrow and the pain into a drive of inspiration. The person he was for my people, for our people, um, is what I use and drives me every single day to keep telling this story. And just to highlight that I'm a father of five kids since the last 11 weeks. I work full time. You know, mm. of course, I would prefer to spend a lot of time with my kids, but I want everyone who listened to me and watch me to understand and reflect that what would you do if your house is on fire and you know that what would you do that you know that if you do not do anything people will enter your home taking all your all your stuff out of house and kill your family i think nobody can sit still and doing nothing if you know that that is happening to your family or your family is being threatened and if you zoom that out to the climate change perspective that is what the scientists are saying us. If we don't act today, our home will be destroyed. How can you sit still and do nothing? And the magical word for me is balancing. As Brother Zuka said, indeed, balancing things in life. Yes, I am father. I have to do my, set my priorities. I have to take care of my family because if I will lose them, I will be disbalanced. So the only thing to do this sustainable is to balance everything in life. And Enjoy it, because when I convince one individual about what is happening in West Papua, it gives me a lot of enthusiasm and optimism to go forward. So it's, it's really a magical moment when you convince people to do the right thing. And you see that every single step is a step forward. And that drives me uh, positively every day. I'm really happy that we're talking more about uh, uh, emotional labor or burnout or I think um, in lots of movements or times this hasn't been that much center uh, of our activism and so we're also I think uh, learned from different movements that you know Everything is about sacrifice. And I am also very much aware of how much other people have sacrificed. Um, so like just being a woman and wearing pants or having being a worker and have a weekend, you know, like being indigenous diasporic and being allowed to walk down the street and not get my head sculpted or, you know, like all of these things people have fought and died for so I also really always feel a responsibility to to find more and more and more and more and more and more courage uh to to do the right thing um to never be lazy and then I really had to learn how to not um how to not be extractivist in uh, of my own life or in my own ways. And I'm still learning that because this extractivist society, you know, it, it has a way of creeping up on us as well. So I don't have the answers there, but one thing that I have learned is that um, it helps to be, um, cautious with your friends like you know who who are your friends because a good friend will you know will go such a long way <laughs> and if you're losing a lot of energy on your friends then yeah you know like it's it's not always healthy and 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 I think friends also sh like sometimes I have a friend and she will take a break. And I think it's also important that with activist collectives now that we applaud each other more for taking a break or to, to say that um, because before, uh, yeah, there, there was like more of a hero culture. And I think this is still happening in a lot of collectives, this hero culture. Um, 
And I think in the end, yeah, the real job of leadership is um, is see other people go beyond what you can do. So in that way, it's also being smart with what you're really good at and kind of see like, okay, so I might be good at this. So it's okay if I don't do that, you know, like somebody else, like have a little bit of faith or trust that somebody else will take care of that other thing. And that's also an exercise of faith in collectivity uh, to, to, yeah, just do well what you can do and then have faith that that is enough. But I think it's an ongoing learning. Like I, I still have a mastered this, but I'm grateful also that my activism isn't only about what I produce and change. It's also what I, um, how I learn to be a better person every day. Like, because it's like detoxing so many things that, you know, um, are actually harmful. Um, and then I, I, I think of activism as as a as a way of detoxing and and actually yeah exercising that muscle of 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 um of creativity as well i think we didn't speak so much about that in the end <laughs> um i think there's still much more to say about that but i think creativity is also a beautiful way to digest um, like we are taught in this extractivist society only to produce or to consume and you know like to truly be cyclical we also need time for digesting and so sometimes it's okay to do emotional labor but afterwards we have to digest the impact <laughs> and I think arts and creative uh, projects can really help with that as well um, so that's also a way of self-care for me thank you um, yes Yes, thank you. Um, so we didn't cover even like a fraction of all the things that I thought we would cover. Um, and yet um, I, I would like to thank you all for your generous and insightful contributions. And um, I feel moved and changed um, just from, you know, what I thought would be a long two hours, but it's, it's just flown by. Um, I know, I know. So I, I hope that we have an opportunity to convene uh, somehow uh, in the near future and, um, and uh, I would just like to thank you again uh, for this panel. Um, so uh, I wonder if Sophia wants to uh, come in and give one last um, plug for the next uh, Crisis Imaginary session. I'm not sure if she's still there. Yes, there she I'm is. still here. Um, on the 25th of August, we'll talk about climate feelings. And I think it's actually, you know, coming from emotional labor to the next um, event, we will address this more. But I would also like to take the chance to thank you all for this wonderful discussion. I feel inspired and humbled and we could talk for another two hours, I feel. Um, but let's keep it like this. Thank you so much, really. Thank you. Thank you.